think Aaron may have preached the sermon this morning through the songs that he picked, but I'm going to go ahead and preach it anyway just to be sure, okay? So if you have a Bible with you, you can open to the Gospel of Mark chapter 8. The Gospel of Mark chapter 8 will be in verses 31 through 38 this morning as we continue this sermon series, then Calvary, as we finish up the Gospel of Mark, finish up the middle part of the Gospel of Mark this morning, um, and uh, just continue to march right on through. And, and uh, this morning, the title of the message is, um, I guess, somewhat fitting for a Memorial Day weekend. Um, it may not be the most encouraging uh, title that I've ever come up with in my life, but the title of the message this morning is Death and Dying. And um, this morning, we're going to see a challenge from Jesus to his followers that, just to be completely honest with you, is not a challenge that um, is easy to hear. It's, it's, it's a call that, that for most of us, we, um, we would gather in a church service and say amen to it, and then we would leave the church service and struggle to be obedient to it. Um, I know that just this week, as I prepared this message, there were many times that I had to stop, even this morning, as I was looking over this sermon this morning in my office, that I had to stop and say, God, am I doing this? Is this who I am? Is what I'm saying this morning a reflection of my life, or is it just lip service? And so I pray this morning that we would um, remember, we'll remember through the Lord's Supper today, but that we will remember, rejoice in the death of our Lord, but also that we would not be reluctant to carry our cross, to die to ourselves, to live for the glory of Jesus in our lives every day. So follow with me, if you will, Mark chapter 8. Again, we'll begin reading in verse 31, and we'll read down to the end of the chapter. God's perfect and inspired word says this. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed, and after three days rise again. He spoke this word openly. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when he had turned around and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. When he had called all the people to himself with the disciples also, he said to them, Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, and whoever, desires, uh, whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous, sinful generation, of him the Son of Man also will be ashamed when he comes in glory of the Father with the holy angels. So if you remember, if you were here last week, if you weren't, we're just going to recap for a moment. We talked last week about how this passage of Scripture is kind of a pivotal turning point in the Gospel of Mark. Jesus has been, has been doing a, a public ministry in the region of Galilee for three years or so. And most everything that he has done, certainly there have been some private things, but most everything that he has done has been on a public scale. There's been public teaching and public healing and, and public ministry going on and on. And one of the things that we talked about last week that, was that in the, in the ministry of Jesus, he begins to start to take a turn. And he begins to focus more, not exclusively, but more on his disciples, on those 12 men who he has called to be followers of him. And he begins to, to teach them. He, he also begins to focus away from, from the healing and, and, and the things like that, but he begins to focus on the cross. That's why we entitled this last part of this sermon series in the Gospel of Mark, Then Calvary, because Jesus begins to physically walk to Jerusalem. He begins to physically walk 
to Calvary, but also his focus of his teaching begins to focus upon the cross that he would bear in just a short amount of time. And we see this begin to flesh out just very quickly um, in verses 31 and 32. It says, and he began to teach them, them being the disciples, um, that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed, and after three days rise again. He spoke this word openly. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. We'll talk about that in a moment. Um, not the best decision he ever made, uh, right? But um, the first thing that we see is that Jesus, again, began to teach them. He began to teach them in private. He's speaking exclusively to his disciples, and he teaches them explicit things. Says, this, is, this is what's going to happen. This is the plan. This is the purpose. This is why I have come. You see, just before this, if you remember, Jesus has asked the disciples an important question or two. He's asked them first, who do men say that I am? And do you remember the response? They said, well, some think John the Baptist, some think Elijah, some think some sort of prophet. And then, as we talked about last week, we, Jesus asked them the most important question. Well, who do you say that I am? What are you going to do with me? What do you believe about me? And Peter, Peter jumps up and says, well, we believe that you're the Christ. We believe that you're the Messiah. What a great moment. Isn't it amazing in our Christian walk how we could go from a really great moment to a really low one just like that? One moment, Peter is acknowledging that, that Jesus is the Messiah, and the next minute, Jesus is calling him Satan, right? That's a, that's a roller coaster if I've ever heard of one, right? And so it's important to see that Jesus doesn't just want them. And here's this is important for us. As we proclaim and teach the gospel, as we, as we disciple one another, as we seek to do evangelism, we must remember this as well. It's important for us to know and to proclaim who Jesus is, but it's also for, uh, important for us to know and proclaim what Jesus has done. We must proclaim that Jesus is the Son of God. We must proclaim that he is the eternal Son of God, that he is the Lamb of God, that, 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 that he is God incarnate. That he is the long-awaited Messiah, all of those things. But we also must proclaim what he has done. That he was rejected, that he went to the cross, that he rose again three days later. It's important for the disciples to understand this because as we see even in this passage of Scripture, the disciples didn't see clearly. Again, referencing our message from last week, but the blind man who... Jesus partially opened his eyes and he saw men walking like trees. He's like, what? Or trees walking like men? I guess men don't walk like trees. Anyway, so, right, I don't think trees walk. So, either way, they didn't see clearly. They needed their eyes to be open. And in this passage of scripture, we again see the disciples not seeing things clearly. Jesus tells them this is going to happen. And Peter says, actually, no, <laughs> we'd rather not do that right? He's not, he doesn't see the plan clearly. So it's important that the disciples not only know who Jesus is, but what Jesus is going to do. It's important for them after Jesus does it. It's important for them to know once Jesus has died on the cross and been buried and been resurrected, as they proclaim that, that they're able to say, listen, this wasn't some random act. This wasn't some, some fluke thing. This was something that was planned before the foundation of the world. This is why Jesus came. Jesus always planned to die. He always planned to suffer. This wasn't something that he decided later. This certainly wasn't something that the Roman government or the Pharisees decided. This was the plan when God created the earth that Jesus would die, that he would suffer, and that he would be raised again. It's important for the disciples to understand this, so Jesus has to tell them that. If you notice in verse 32, it says he spoke this word openly. That just means he explained it clearly. There have been many times so far in Jesus' ministry that he hasn't spoke as clearly as the disciples would have liked. He's spoken in parables and in different stories, and many times he would tell a story or a parable, and then disciples would come back and say, what? We don't, we don't understand what you're talking about. Jesus didn't speak in parables. Jesus didn't speak in some sort of imagery. Jesus says, I'm going to suffer. I'm going to be rejected. I'm going to die. Then I'm going to be raised again. Isn't that amazing? 
Who else in the whole world can say that, right? There's no one else in the history of all the world that says, you know what, I'm going to die, but don't worry, I'm coming back, folks. No one, no one can say that. Lazarus, who was raised from the dead, when he died, he didn't tell his sisters, don't worry, Jesus is coming, he's going to raise me from the dead. Did he? No one has ever said that, but Jesus just looks him in the eye and says, I'm going to be betrayed, I'm going to suffer, I'm going to die, and then I'm going to be raised again. So the context of the lesson is simply that, that he would suffer, that he would be rejected, that he would be killed, that he would be resurrected. I want you to notice a word in here that's important. Look again in verse 31. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And after three days, rise again. He, he must do this. Jesus, again, is affirming the plan of the Father from before time. He says, I have to do this. There, there's no way around it. There, there's probably been many times in, in your lives where you looked at a situation that was coming up and you thought, ah, it's not my favorite thing, right? I would rather not do this but I must. Jesus says, I must do this. Why? Well, first, to fulfill God's plan, to fulfill the plan of redemption that God had set in motion before the beginning of time. Second, to fulfill God's word. All of this book from here to here is about that very thing. And if Jesus doesn't do those things, then all of the rest of this book is false. And if all the rest of the book is false, then we have no reason to believe that Jesus is who he says he is or will do what he says he can do, and we might as well go home and barbecue. So he has to do this to fulfill God's plan, to fulfill the word. But the other reason that he has to do this is because no one else can. Because no one else can. There are probably things in your life where that's been that way too, right? So... Uh, uh, we've talked about this uh, a few times, but one of the joys and um, struggles that we have in our home is in the winter time, uh, we burn wood in order to keep our house warm, um, and we burn a lot of it because my wife likes it to be anywhere between ninety-five and Satan's <laughs> living room, right? And and so we use a lot of that, right? And so I have this chainsaw it's my favorite chainsaw it's a it's a 24 inch echo chainsaw when you start it it sounds like a small block chevy it's the greatest thing i've ever had i, I love that chainsaw but the problem is is it's also heavy and i'm also getting older and weaker by the day and so i keep looking while we're cutting wood and thinking hey you think solomon's ready for the 24 incher yet and his mom said no his mom says no Solomon's not ready for that yet, right? And I think maybe Benson. Uh, no, not, probably not Benson. Maybe Canaan. That's as tall as Canaan. We can't, right? So if it's going to get done, I've got to do it. The only one who can or will. You see, Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus was the only one to live a perfect, spotless life who never did anything wrong and always did everything right. We need to remember that about Jesus. We don't talk about that enough. We always talk about Jesus living a perfect life, and he never did anything wrong, but he also always did everything right. There were no sins of commission or omission in the life of Jesus Christ. He's the lamb. Only that lamb will do. And the last thing is this, because without this, there's no gospel. Without the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, there's no gospel. There's no hope. There's no reason for us to be here. Without the shedding of his blood, there's no atonement for your sin. Without his resurrection of the uh, 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 back to life, there's no life for you from the dead. The Bible says that we're dead in our trespasses. And if Jesus doesn't raise from the, from the grave, the trespasses can't be forgiven and we can't be made alive. There's no gospel. There's no hope. He must do it. He must do it. So Jesus openly, clearly, plainly teaches them what he's going to do. And then we have a pair of rebukes that come. Look in verse 
32b through 33. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when he had turned around and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. So Peter begins to rebuke Jesus. He takes Jesus aside. Doesn't this just seem absolutely crazy that anyone would even think to do this? But Peter, in his boldness and his arrogance, walks up and he, he probably takes Jesus by the arm and leads him over. And we don't know exactly what he said, but he begins to rebuke him. And see, we need to understand that in, that, in this text, when it says rebuke, when Peter rebuked Jesus and when Jesus rebuked Peter, the word for that in, in the Greek is not some sort of like, uh, he didn't walk over to Jesus and say, now listen, Jesus, are you sure this is a good idea? Do you, do you really want to die? This word rebuke is the same word that was used when Jesus rebuked the winds and the waves. And he said, shut up and be still. He stood in authority over those wind and those waves and he told it to stop. It's the same word. Peter comes to Jesus and sternly warns him that's what that word means he sternly warned jesus why would he do this i think there's probably three simple reasons why jesus would or why peter would want to interact with jesus like this first i'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt i'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt on the first one i think he probably just didn't want jesus to die right Peter and Jesus have been friends for three years. They've done everything together. They've gone everywhere together. They have a, they have a relationship. They have a friendship. They have a, a brotherhood that they've built. And when, when he says, I'm going to be betrayed, I'm going to suffer, and I'm going to die, he says, well, I don't want that to happen. Right? I, I don't want that to happen to you. So probably he just doesn't want his friend Jesus to be suffering. He doesn't want him to die. I think the second reason is probably just as logical I don't think Peter wants to die either. And Peter knows that if Jesus goes, he goes. Remember, Peter thinks, remember, all the way up to, to Jesus' uh, uh, arrest, Jesus, Peter thinks this is about war. Peter's ready to pull a sword. Peter's ready to fight. He thinks this is about an uprising. He thinks about an overthrowing. Well, if your king dies in war, guess, who, guess what happens to the soldiers? They die too. Peter says, well, I I don't know if I signed up for betrayal. I don't know if I signed up for suffering. I don't, I don't know if I want to die. But I think the third reason, we talked about this a little bit already, that Peter begins to rebuke Jesus is because he just doesn't get it. He doesn't understand. He, he's still looking through that murky glass that's half full he knows jesus is the messiah but he just doesn't understand how the messiah can die how do you win by dying right it doesn't make any sense when i when i was in high school i, I tell my kids this too when i was in high school and playing baseball uh, a lot of times we would we would practice on turning double plays and when you turn a double play in baseball you've got to be fast because you've got to get the ball, throw the ball twice, and it's got to be quick. And so the tendency is to, is to do everything quickly. And so you would get the ball quickly, and you would throw the ball quickly, and you would catch it again quickly and throw it quickly. But what happens when you do everything quickly is you probably mess up. And you have a tendency to make a bad throw or to make a bad catch, and then nobody's out, right? And you could have had two, and now you have nothing. And so our high school baseball coach used to tell us this. He used to say, slow down so you can speed up. Slow down so you can speed up. That makes no sense, right? Makes no sense. It makes no sense for your king to die so that you can gain victory, does it? It's easy for us to understand. We've heard it our whole lives. Peter is just now hearing about this. <laughs> what? You die and we win? This doesn't make any sense. And so Jesus has to make it more clear. So Peter begins to rebuke Jesus, and then Jesus rebukes Peter. 
Look what it says again in verse 32. Then Peter took him aside, notice this word, and began to rebuke him. But when he had turned around and looked at the disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Peter began to rebuke, and that didn't last very long. He didn't finish. Jesus finishes his rebuke. Peter just gets started, and Jesus is like, Nope. Not today, Peter. <laughs> Isn't that our church? Not today, Satan? Anyway. Anyway, so, not today. You don't rebuke me, I rebuke you. I think he was also rebuking the rest of the disciples. If you look in verse 33, it says, but when he had turned around and looked at his disciples, they were all of the same mind. They just didn't have the guts to say it. There's always that one in the group, isn't it? There's always that one guy in the group who'll say what everybody's thinking, and sometimes you wish he wouldn't. And then you look at him like, mm, how's that going to go? Peter said it. Peter said what they were all thinking, and Jesus rebukes them all. But in this rebuke, Jesus says something that's just really difficult. He looks at the man who will preach the first ever gospel sermon in the book of Acts. He looks at the man who writes multiple books of the Bible. He looks at the man who is understood to be one of the leaders of the disciples calls him Satan. That seems a bit harsh, doesn't it? Why does he call him Satan? Well, one, I don't think he does. I don't think that he actually is calling him literally Satan. He says that he has, in verse 33, for you, this is the reason, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but of the things of men. He is thinking like Satan. He is thinking like like men, he does not have the mind of God. If you don't have the mind of God, if you're not for God, you're what? You're against him. There, there, there's not a middle ground. That, that, that's, what, that's what we want to do today, isn't it? That's what everybody wants to do. We want to play the middle. We want to make everybody happy. We, we don't want to insult the world, and we want to make everybody happy at church, and so let's just find some middle ground to play. Listen, there isn't middle ground. You're for Jesus or you're against him. You're, you're his enemy or you're his son or daughter. There's no other way. There's no other way. R.C. Sproul reminded me of something as I was studying for this. He said that he called Peter Satan because Satan proposed the exact same thing to Jesus. In Matthew chapter 4, verses 8 through 11, we see Satan tempt Jesus. And this is what it says. It says, again, the devil took him up on the, an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their glory. And he said to them, all these things I give you, if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, the angels came and ministered to him. You see, what, what Satan was offering Jesus was kingship without suffering. He was offering him kingship. All you've got to do is bow down. You don't have to go through this whole cross ordeal. You don't have to go through this whole rejection situation. You don't have to suffer. You don't have to worry about the Roman soldiers and their cat of nine tails. You don't have to do all of this. Bow down. Nobody will see you and you'll have a kingdom. He was offering him a kingdom without suffering. And Peter says, you don't have to go to the cross. We'll fight this battle. Just overtake the Romans. We'll set up a kingdom right here. Don't worry. You don't have to do that. Here's the last reason that Jesus rebuked Peter. And that he rebuked him sternly. In Revelation chapter 3 verse 19. It says this. As many as I love. I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. He didn't rebuke Peter because he hated Peter. He rebuked Peter because he loved Peter. Because he didn't want to see Peter chasing after the ideas of man. And he wanted Peter to repent and turn. Do you, do you notice what, again, I can't spend all day here. We have a lot of stuff to do today. But look what he says. You are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of man. He wanted Peter to repent 
He wanted him to turn. Turn your mind away from the things of man. Turn your mind to the things of God. Polar opposite directions. It's crazy, but when Jesus calls Peter Satan, he's saying, I love you. And I don't want you to stay this way. We have more confirmation of that when we begin to read verse 34 through 38. Look in, verse, look in these verses with me, if you will. When he had called the people to himself with his disciples also, he said to them, whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and make, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man also will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. I'm going to talk about the rest of this in a moment, but I just want to remind you of something really important here. Peter has just been rebuked very sternly by his master. Peter has just stuck his foot in his mouth as deep as he has ever stuck it in his mouth. And Jesus gathers people together and says, follow me. He didn't do what he did to Satan at his temptation. Remember Satan's tempta or Satan tempting Jesus? Jesus said this in verse 10 of Matthew 4, Away with you, Satan! Get away! I'm done! You're defeated! I'm not doing it! Leave! He could have told Peter that, but he told Peter, follow me. How many times has God had to tell you that? How many times has he had to tell me that? Just stop doing that and follow me. No, not that either. Follow me. You are slow. Come on. Follow me. Right? Like you are just not getting it. Follow me. What an amazing picture that is. He calls Peter Satan, and then he gathers him up, and he says, anybody want to follow me? Because I want you to come. I want you to be my disciple. I want you to be my follower. So Jesus proclaims that he's going to die, and then he speaks of another cross. Verse 34 and 35 when he had called all the people to himself with his disciples also, he said to them, whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. This is difficult, church. This is difficult. In verse 34, Jesus is using some words and some imagery that, that we want to kind of sugarcoat, I think. <laughs> we want to make them sound easier right? But they're not easy. He first says to deny himself. Let him deny himself. That, that means to, to walk away from yourself. Turn your back on yourself. There, there's a difference between deny himself and self-denial. Do we understand that? Self-denial. So for six weeks now, I, you've already heard about this, and it's about this time of the morning that it starts really affecting me, so probably you're going to hear about this in every sermon for I don't know, the rest of our lives are until I give in and go back to it. But for six weeks now, I haven't had a little Debbie. I know. For six weeks, I have not eaten a little Debbie. And there's star crunches and there's all sorts of things in our, isn't there, Solomon? They're all over. Mom just keeps buying them. Right? That's self-denial. That's, well, this one part of me, I think I should fix, so I'm not going to do this, Right? I'm not going to have this thing. I'm not going to do that thing. I'm going to give up. The, that's, that, that's just a little bit of self-denial. To deny self, to deny self is different. To deny self is to say, this life is not about me. This life is not for my best interest. I'm not the center of this world. Deny yourself. And then he says, take up your cross. We need to understand again. We've, we, I think we probably do, but it's worth saying. 
in our culture today, crosses, especially for those of us who are believers in Jesus, a cross is a symbol of hope. A cross is a symbol of love. It's a symbol of mercy. It's a symbol of forgiveness. In that culture, a cross meant one thing. A horrible, horrible death. A horrible death. Jesus is saying, we're, we're doing these passages. We could do them separately for time's sake, but we're doing them together because Jesus is saying, I'm going to die for you. You die and follow me. When he says, take up your cross, hear this, church. It's so important. He isn't saying, carry a burden. Okay? Now, granted, Many times, the, even Jesus, the people who were being led to crucifixion, would carry their cross. But he's not talking about simply the carrying burden. He's talking about the end result. He says, come and die. Come and die. If you're visiting this morning, you're like, what is wrong with this guy? But that's what he says. Get your cross and die. That's what makes his statement, before you zone out because of the bad news, listen to the good news, right? Because his statement before isn't just about dying, is it? It isn't just about dying. It says, listen to verse 31 again, the end of verse 31. And be killed, and after three days, what? Rise again after three days. Jesus says, come and die, because if you come and die, you'll have life everlasting. If you come and die, you'll have a life that matters. You'll have a life that isn't wasted. You'll have a life that matters not just in this world, but in eternity. You, listen, this is Memorial Day weekend, and, and, and some of you will go and you'll visit graves of family members, and you'll walk past, past people who are long forgotten. Even if their lives mattered, even if they were great people, they've been long forgotten. Jesus says, you come and die, and your life can matter for all of eternity. Your life can have substance. It can be more than just the dollar you made or the thing you gave to your kids or whatever it is. He says, live a life that counts. Live a life that counts. Why? For your sake? For your glory? So your name, so you get something named after you? No. For whoever desires, verse 35, to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life, listen, for my sake and the gospels will save it. Who gives up his life for the sake of Christ? For the sake of the gospel. Every one of these disciples outside of Judas would do exactly that. They would give up their lives for the sake of the name of Jesus and the gospel of Jesus. There are people even still today, we talked about this earlier, we come here in safety and freedom. There are people who still today who are giving up their lives, literally, for the sake of the name of Jesus and the gospel of Jesus Christ. He says, give it up. Look at verse 36 and 37. We've got to keep going. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? You see, he now has talking about this idea of almost a financial transaction, this, this weights and measures. He says, you look at the world and you see value. You see all of the things that you think you must have and, and all the riches that you must amass. He says, you can get all sorts of things. You can get all sorts of money and relationships and, and property and, and stuff. You can get all sorts of stuff. But in comparison to your soul for eternity, that stuff doesn't mean anything. 
Yesterday was a, a reminder for my family. We had an estate auction for my grandfather's farm. And we watched tractor after tractor be loaded on somebody else's trailer. It was difficult. It was difficult to watch my dad and his brothers pull out of my grandma's house and parade them down for the last time. It was difficult to watch. But you know what? That stuff means nothing compared to your soul. It's useless. It's rubbish. It's scrap iron. It'll be melted down and burned up one day. It doesn't matter. All the stuff that we're seeking in this world, all the things we think we have to have, it doesn't matter compared to our soul, compared to a life and a legacy that matters for a kingdom. It doesn't make any difference. All of the stuff that you're getting is going to get auctioned off one day, friends. It's going to go to somebody else. It's going to be given to a grandkid who doesn't care. It doesn't make any difference. Invest in eternal things, church. Invest in eternal things, Ben. Quit worrying about the temporary. The temporary doesn't matter. And here's, here's the thing I want you to, to, I want to grasp. It's not even close. You can pile all of the things of the world on this side of the scale, and you can, you can pile, put just eternity with Jesus on this side, and this side slams to the ground every time. It's not even close. He says, what will you pay? What's it worth? I was thinking about this this morning in my office. What's your soul worth? Jesus asks them. You know, right now, some of you come from not very far away and some of you drive a, a little bit of a distance to get to church and uh, the economy is not great and i don't know if you notice gas prices are a little high um it's just and maybe you didn't notice anyway uh so if if my friend bill over there were to stand up right now and say hey i got five bucks you want it first off he's never said that to me in our lives but it if, if he were to say that, I would say, yeah, I, that, that'll get me a gallon, right? So I, I'd go, I'd walk this, it was worth my time to walk the 20 feet to Bill and get the $5 bill, right? I think most of us would do that. Some of you would be like, oh, no, I wouldn't do that. Yeah, whatever, right? <laughs> I, I, right? I would walk over there and get, and get it. But if Bill calls me this afternoon at 3 o'clock and says, hey, I had $5 I wanted to give to you at church this morning, and I forgot... Do you want to come out to the house and get it? Well, see, Bill lives 20 miles away. My truck gets 10 miles to the gallon. Gas is four to, I'm not great at math, Wheeler, but here's the thing. I'm not driving out there for five bucks. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. If you're not a believer in Jesus Christ and you're seeking after the things of the world and you're seeking after hope, if you've fallen away from Jesus and you're seeking after the things of the world, let me tell you something very clearly. It is not worth it. It is not worth it. Your soul is immensely valuable. That's why Jesus died for it. It is not worth it. The last thing is this. Look at verse 38. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in glory of his Father with the holy angels. He talks about denying himself. He talks about the value of their soul. He talks with them about being unashamed. You see, again, we have a tendency to marginalize these words. He says, don't be ashamed. To be ashamed is to, is to hold back, to hide, to, to be a recluse, to not let anyone see. If I have something that I'm ashamed of, I hide it in the back and I don't let anyone see it. I don't want anybody to know. The opposite of being ashamed is not just liking something. The opposite of being ashamed of something is proclaiming something, right? 
So that thing, that, 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 that thing in your yard that you like the most, you put it in the front, right? The, the thing that in your house that you like the most, you put it in the living room because you're proud of that thing. You put the thing that you're ashamed of in the room that nobody goes in, right? And, and, and so the idea here is not just say, well, I'm not ashamed of Jesus. If you say you're not ashamed of Jesus and you're not willing to proclaim Jesus, then you haven't gotten the message. He says, don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed of my, listen, again, man, we are so far out of time. Don't be ashamed of my cross. He's asking them to identify with something that was reserved for men who had probably only murdered or raped or stole. That's what the cross was reserved for. And Jesus says, identify with my words about the cross. Don't be ashamed of my cross. The cross is a shameful place in that culture. Here's how the Apostle Paul gives an example of this. In Philippians chapter 3, verses 8 through 11, he says this. Yet indeed, I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom, I'm suffer- for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his his death, if by any means I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Paul says, I count everything in this world as rubbish for just a couple of things, that I may have the knowledge of Christ, the righteousness of Christ, and the life of Christ. Everything in the world pales in comparison to that. So friend, this morning, my encouragement to you is this. And please understand, my encouragement to myself is this. Do not hold on to the temporary things of life. Make your life matter for the kingdom of God. Proclaim and do not deny the person and the work of Jesus. Come and die so that you can live. So that your life counts. I'm not all that concerned anymore if people think my life counts on this earth. I'm more concerned if when I stand before Jesus, if he thinks my life counted. Let's pray together as the worship team comes. Heavenly Father, this morning we we are humbled at the love that Jesus has shown through the cross. We're thankful that he didn't just say those words to his disciples, but that he fulfilled them perfectly. That he has died as the substitute for our sin. Father, we know that you are a giver of good gifts and blessings, and we experience them every day. But Father, help us to put them aside, to lay them aside, to not seek after them, but to seek after the sake and the glory of Jesus and his gospel. Father, this morning I pray for anyone within the sound of my voice who maybe today has yet to experience the salvation that comes through Jesus Christ. They've yet to turn away from the things of this world and turn to Jesus for salvation. I pray that today would be that day. Father, I pray that you would help us to be honest with ourselves this this morning. 
that we would be honest about what we're seeking after, what the priorities in our life really are. And Father, if we need to repent, if we need to turn, if we need to give something up, Father, we ask that you would help us to be clear in our understanding and bold in our actions. God, we love you today. We thank you for Jesus. We ask this in his name. Amen.